Now, mind you, what I always find interesting about this is that this is only half the story, right? This is only showing you, you know, kind of like select, you know, columns, expressions, et cetera. You have this, you know, where condition. Well, that condition can be anything, right? What about grouping element? What are those? And having conditions. And then we get into windowing, right? We'll talk about windowing. That's one of the specific things we'll talk about quite a bit later. But then we've also got, you know, an order by clause, and then we even have these offsets and fetches and all kinds of interesting things. But what's really great is that little from item, right? That's not complicated at all, is it? <laughs> so this is what the this is just the from item clause from a select statement, right? So and we'll talk about laterals, right? And then we'll also uh, talk about different join types a little bit, but I'm going to kind of breeze through those pretty quickly because this is supposed to be advanced SQL, and I only have an hour. All right, so really quickly, a couple interesting things not everybody is aware of that I like to point out. Uh, values is a top-level uh, query in Postgres. You can just say values. It just works. So is table. You may not have seen this before, but it's actually just a select star from, but way shorter. So these are all valid queries in Postgres, right? You can just say values. This will give you a table of three rows. That's terribly, terribly useful for just playing around with data, right? If you have like some test data or whatever, you just build a values construct, and then you can put that anywhere that you can put a table. Pretty cool. It basically works as a subselect. Table author is pretty nice, but it only works top level. So these two are actually equivalent. Um, and then just some other stuff. I'm not going to go into it too much. Uh, then we have, you know, where clauses, order buys. You can have ascending, descending. This is all pretty typical stuff. If you're lost now, you're going to be way lost in a minute. <laughs> we then have, uh, you know, basic group by, order by, right? Uh, aggregation queries. So these are pretty straightforward. And then we have a nice having clause here. Some of price has to be greater than 20 inside of this grouping clause in order to uh, have a result from this particular query. These are all pretty, pretty straightforward stock, simple stuff, right? Well, let's start talking a little bit about uh, different join types. So a lot of people are familiar with all the simple types of queries. But then let's start talking about cross joins, right? How many people here know what a cross join is? Okay, all right, all right, good, good number of people, all right, but not everybody. We then have inner joins, outer joins. So cross joins pretty straightforward. It just takes every row from the first table and combines it with every row from the second table, right? So this kind of a cross join here is actually equivalent to what I would call a comma join, right? There are some use cases. One of the use cases that can be really fun is to actually take and have this side be a values clause. Right, so you have a value subselect on the right. Sorry, you have a value subselect on the right, and then you have some table you're joining against on the left. Right, and you do a cross join so that you can enumerate rows for every combination of those sets. Days of the week, for example. Right, you take days of the week and you put it into a values construct, and then you take something that you want to have split across every day of the week, and you can cross join those two together. Um, one of the things that you have to watch out for, though, is that you can unintentionally get cross joins if you don't have um, appropriate conditionals, right? Because it's this comma join, it's the same type, you can end up getting a Cartesian product because of uh, the fact that you don't have enough conditionals that are constraining this join. So there's nothing constraining this join right now. When you get into larger, complicated queries, you end up in cases where there's nothing, you know, you're, you're forgetting that there's something that needs to constrain a particular join. Which is one of the reasons why I strongly encourage using this kind of join syntax, right? So you say from table one, join, and then you use an on condition or a using clause. And we'll talk a little bit about those in a second. Uh, note here that inner join is kind of the default, right? If you don't say something, it's an inner join. Inner join is only give me rows where things match, right? Where this condition is true and there are rows on both sides from it. Um, you can also use 
a comma join with a where clause, but again, I, it's not what I would recommend. When you're going to start writing larger SQL queries, you should really be using join syntax, either an on clause, which is typically what people argue is the best option, is to use an on clause. Uh, using clause, you can use and just specify a, common, uh, a column list, and then those columns have to exist in both tables, though, right, uh, in order to be able to do the join. You can also do a natural join. Uh, this is something that a lot of people discourage, and the reason why people discourage a, a, a natural join is that if you go add a column and that to a table and that column happens to exist in the other table you're doing a natural join with, you end up unintentionally adding that as another conditional into your join. So here's a couple of examples of just some inner joins. Um, pretty straightforward. Again, inner is actually just a noise word here. It's not required. But this is just joining book against publisher on some uh, couple of columns. And here's an example where you can use a using clause and just specify book ID. So in this case, book ID is a column that exists in Bebo and in author. All right, so outer joins. Let's talk about these really quickly. So outer joins are left join, right join. Um, you can also do uh, full join, which gives you both. But essentially, it gives you all the records from you know, the left table, if you're doing a left join. And then it'll give you the records on the right filled out with values that come from the right-hand table if there's a matching row. If there's no matching row, it'll fill it out with nulls. Pretty straightforward. So here's an example of uh, the syntax for outer joins. Right? And outer here is a noise word, but you do need to specify if it's going to be left, right, or full. Otherwise, it's basically the same. You can have an on condition and a using clause. So. Here's an example where this would give you all of the book categories, so everything from book category table, and then those uh, entries in the book table that match up to some book category. So if there's a category that doesn't have any books, it would still be listed here because it's a right join, so we're going to pull all the records from the book category table. Here we would have all the publishers even if they don't have a book, right, because we're grabbing all the records from the left-hand table. And then, again, any rows that, uh, they, where there isn't uh, a record on the right-hand side from this table, from this book table, would just get filled out with nulls. So pretty straightforward. So let's start playing around with some set operations. So uh, set operations are things that I don't think a lot of people are familiar with or don't use as much, um, but they're pretty handy in SQL as well. So here's just an initial data set. This is the data set we're going to play with kind of throughout. Um, I happened to give this uh, as a training with Joe Conway um, where we actually did uh, advanced SQL and uh, functions. Uh, that was actually, and so that's why poor Joe's name is up here a lot. <laughs> so here's an example where you can say where you're using a, using a union clause, right? So here union basically says give me this set, give me this set, combine them, deduplicate them, and give me the results. So here we're taking the title column and the author name column, and we're shoving them into the same column. Note that a union is a little bit expensive because it does that deduplication, right? If you don't care about duplicates, you can use a union all. So here you can see that with the union all, I have repeats in here, right? Because that author column had my name listed three times and Joe's name listed three times, right? So. We, Union all, on the other hand, is much cheaper because it doesn't have to worry about duplicates. It just appends the records. So that ends up being very fast. Other things you can do is an intersect, right? So intersect is give me things that are in common to both sets, right? So this is a, a set overlap, right? That's what an intersect is. Um, here there isn't anything coming out of it because there aren't any uh, entries where the title and the author name are the same. You can also use what's called an accept. Uh, in Oracle, this is called a minus. So you can basically say, give me everything from this uh, table except things that exist inside of this other set. So pretty straightforward title. And then nothing gets eliminated because there aren't any overlaps. So pretty straightforward. All right, now let's start talking about some of the really interesting stuff, subqueries. So an uncorrelated subquery basically just calculates a constant result uh, set and then plugs it in, right? So this particular example is an uncorrelated subquery. And what that means is that this query here 
inside of the parentheses down here doesn't depend on anything in the outer query. All right? So this average of book dot price from book is only operating against things inside of this query. It's not making any references to anything outside of it. And what this query is saying is, give me the books that are greater than the average book price. So in this case, we have these four books that are, have, a, have a price that's greater than the average. What this also means is that this, because it's an uncorrelated subquery, means we can execute this just once for the overall query and then return the results. Correlated subqueries are different, right? So in a correlated subquery, and this is where we start to get into some, some fun things, there's actual references inside of these parentheses, right, inside of this subquery to objects or, or bits of the outside query. So in this case, we're using, uh, we're actually renaming book to be book outer, right? So we're aliasing it because we're working with a book outer and a book on the inside as well. So we want to make sure that we can tell the distinction between the two. And then here we're saying, okay, where exists, oh, I died, sorry. So where exists um, is basically saying whenever there's a record that returns from this, right? Whenever that happens, we're gonna actually return that record. So in this case, what we're looking at here is we're gonna say from the outer query, right, we're gonna look for books inside that match the, on the language, but are a different book. And then we're gonna get the absolute value between those two, and if it's less than or equal to 20, then we're gonna return that record. Right, so this is a, a correlated subquery. So you can think about this as operating for every row, right? For each row that uh, we come across in the book table, we're gonna run this subquery and come up with the result, right? We're gonna take that value, that row from book outer, plug it into that query on the inside, right, where, the, where book outer is referenced, and then we're gonna calculate, okay, does this exist or not exist means did a row get returned or not? So a lot of people use select star or select one inside of that uh, exist clause because it doesn't actually matter, right? It doesn't matter, you know, that select star doesn't ever actually return anything. It just returns whether a row got returned or not. So in this particular case, this could have been rewritten um, as a join instead. So here's an example of what that ends up, you know, resulting in. So nothing, nothing too special there. But this is basically the cases where the absolute value for that price, for that book from the outside was within 20, right, of the other book inside. So this is where books of different, you know, two different books in the same language had a price within that range of 20. So it's a bit of a contrived example, but that's what a correlated subquery looks like. So I realize I'm moving a little bit quick. I'm just I've got a lot to cover in the second half of this, but does anybody have any questions about correlated or uncorrelated subqueries? Yeah. So uh, the question is, you know, could you use a temporary table to avoid doing a subquery? The short answer is yes, right? You could use a, a, a temporary table. You could also use a common table expression, which we're gonna get into in a minute. Um, yeah. There, is there a, a trade-off between using a temporary table or doing that? So yeah, so, the, the, so that's a great question, right? Um, the question is, is there a trade-off between using a temporary table or using a correlated subquery? And the, the answer is absolutely, right? The more information that you give Postgres to be able to do an operation, um, something like this kind of a query, the more the optimizer is gonna be able to actually optimize it. Right, so the optimizer can do a lot with this kind of a query, right, and flip it into a join and whatnot, whereas if you're using a temporary table, we have to go build that entire temporary table and fill the results, you know, with what you tell us to put in there, right? And then if you don't have an index on that temporary table, then the only way to access it is to scan it, right, which may or may not be good. Um, CTEs are actually the same way. Uh, we'll talk about those in a minute, though. Uh, all right. So I think the short answer to the question is, 
a lot of times you are going to want to use a correlated subquery, right, or even an uncorrelated subquery, rather than a temporary table because the optimizer will be able to find a better solution, right, something that will actually return faster. All right, let's start talking about the interesting stuff. So, windowing functions. So, a windowing function is like an aggregate, right, you know, sum, count, whatever, regular aggregates. Those can also be windowed, uh, be used with windowing functions. Um, the way that they work, though, is that they're actually restricted to operate on a subset of the data, okay? And that subset of the data, we're going to operate that aggregate across, and then we're going to use the same results from that aggregate, okay, across multiple rows, all right? So here you can see that you can specify the function name, and then you have this over clause, right? And you can either specify a window definition or you can specify a window name to, to have that operate over. If you specify a window name, um, then you can actually put the window uh, clause at the end. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Down here in the bottom, you can see that we have a partition by and an order by. All right, and those are the, the two main things. Then we also have a frame clause, and I'll talk about the frame clause next. But partition by is how you partition up the data that's coming back, right? And then you can specify an order by that says how to treat that uh, data when it's being processed by the windowing function, okay? And we'll, get, we'll talk about that in just a second as well. All right, so let's talk about the frame clause. This is kind of the easy part first, right? So a frame clause says you can specify as being range unbounded preceding, right? So if you think about the data set that you're getting back, okay, you specify I want all the rows from the partition start up through the last peer, okay? The last peer is basically the last um, value that is the same, okay? So if you've got a, a table that's got, you know, English, 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 right, those are all considered peers, right, because it's the same value, right, there's no distinction between them. So those are considered peers. Um, and the peer is defined by the order by clause, okay, so the order by clause is what will tell you whether or not a given set is being uh, considered together or not. You can also have, and then, you know, range unbounded proceeding is, I want all the records before this one up to my current, you know, peer record. You can also specify that you want the entire partition, right? So you can say range between unbounded proceeding and unbounded following. So you want all the items inside of this particular uh, partition to be considered for this row when we're calculating out the uh, windowing function, right? Whatever, the, whatever that aggregate is. Remember, these are all feeding into an aggregate of some kind. If you don't want to use um, peers, right, if you don't want duplicates to be treated as the same, you want them to be treated differently, you can use rows instead, right? And that will just go row by row, and it will ignore duplicates. So let's start looking at some of these, okay? So here's an example where we're just gonna do very simple, we're gonna have the average price partitioned by language, right? So what this means is that I'm gonna take my result set, I'm gonna split it up based on language, right? And then I'm gonna run this aggregate function across that. And then whenever I have a set, a row being returned, I'm gonna stick the results of that average in it. Right, so here you can see we have English here, as one language and German is the other. And you can see these are the averages, right? So for English, the average was 76.6 blah, right? And the average for German was 71.6. Does everybody kind of follow how that works? So we're partitioning up the result set, we're running average across each of the partitions, and then we're producing the results for that on each row. It's a very, very straightforward, very basic windowing function. All right. Now, one of the other things that we're able to do 
with a windowing function is that we can treat it just like a regular function, right? So here, the only difference here is that I'm just adding this round function, right? But I can take the results of that function, right, that windowing function, that aggregate call, and use it just like I would the results of a regular column. So here I'm rounding that average price. That's the only difference in this particular query. So the, the comma 2 after the, after the over, it operates on the... So the comma 2 is part of the round call. So the round takes two parameters, okay. right? The first parameter is the results of the average of the price, right, over that partition by. And then the 2 is how many decimal places. Any other questions about that? All right, so now we can talk about using range, right? So if we want to do range unbounded proceeding, right, now we're talking about uh, basically all the duplicates being considered part of the same group, and the function is run across all of them. So here we are doing something very similar, actually, to that prior one. This is basically the same query, except we're using, um, except we're being explicit about it, right? So this is range unbounded proceeding. And then this is the distinction against that, where if you want to use rows, right? So now, instead of duplicates being considered the same, right, as being all together as part of one peer group, now we're going to go row by row instead, even though that there may be duplicates. Right, so here we have duplicates, but we're going to get a running average. Okay, so this is a row by row running average. Is everybody kind of following that? So, you know, basically for each row, we're calculating the average of that row plus all the rows above it. Right, so that first one, average of 100 is 100. Right, average of 180 is 90. Right, and then the average of 180 and 50 is 76, and so forth, right? So this is just giving us a, a, running, a running average here. Now, the other one was also a running average, but it was a running average across, you know, with peer groups, right? Instead of here, where it's just row by row. So these windowing clauses, as you can imagine, can get kind of annoying, right? So you can end up with some very complicated windowing clauses. And if you want to make sure that you're using the same windowing clause for multiple different aggregates, you can name that windowing clause explicitly. So here at the bottom, I'm specifying window my window as, and then I'm specifying this partition by language, which is similar to what we were doing earlier. right? And then I'm using that for both the average and the sum. Right? So they're going to operate on the same window. makes it a little bit easier to work with uh, windowing functions when you set up a, a couple of windows to work with. And you can have more than one window defined here too. If you have different ways you want to slice and dice a given uh, aggregate or a given query. So this is just, I'm just showing the results here. So this is average and sum, right, when we're partitioning by language here. All right, there's also a pretty handy function called row number. So you may have seen this in other uh, database systems. Postgres didn't actually have it until we got windowing functions because it's the right way to implement it, frankly. Um, some of the other ways have been discussed were pretty, uh, pretty hacky, if you will. But here we're just going to add in this row number. And note here that I'm saying over, and then I'm just doing you know, open, close paren, right? So this is just over everything, right? So I want a row number across the entire set. But then I'm going to have a different windowing clause here that I'm going to use for the average and sum that's going to be partitioned by language. Right? And so here you can see I've got a row number that's now been added. Otherwise, it's the same. We also have rank. Right? So rank is basically you can say, OK, I want you to rank these um, in the order. Right? So here I'm saying order by title. Right, so alphabetically, I want to rank um, the books by title and add that in as another 
um, column into my result set. Otherwise, I'm going to keep the same window for the uh, partition by language for the average and the sum. And here you can see we have this rank now across title. Now you also notice that now the ordering of the results has changed, right? So having an order by inside of a windowing function like that may end up reordering the rows, but of course you can still specify your own explicit order by outside, right? And your explicit order by will take precedence over every, you know, will be what actually ends up resulting in the uh, query. So here I'm gonna have the result be ordered by price. And now you can see, you know, we're ordered by price ascending, but the title, you know, the rank is still associated with title. Sorry. Rank is still associated with title here, and you can see that the uh, rank is still correct, even though the uh, ordering of the rows is now shifted based on my order by price. I'm sorry, this is not equal to rank, rank uh, row number. This is not row number anymore. This is rank. Well, it's similar, yeah, but it's not, but, yeah, it's not the same. <laughs> the difference is, is when, when, you, when you actually have, like, two yeah. items, the rank repeats. Right, right, actually, I'm, right, I'm actually going to get to that in a second. <laughs> Window functions rank duplicates, right? So rank handles duplicates instead, unlike row number. Right, so if what we want to do is we want to see, okay, when things are equal, we want the same number, right? That's what rank will give you, um, whereas row number, as you said, would give you a different number anyway, right? Because it would go row by row. So here we're going to go rank over language, right? Over order by language, and here you can see, right? I'm getting one 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 four 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 because that's what rank produces rather than row number. All right, any other questions about windowing functions? I know there's, there's a lot to kind of absorb in there. Yes? So, if I want to use the first book of each language, I would do a role, I would have to use a subquery to limit. Uh, yeah, if you wanted, yeah, it, there's actually another way you can do that. So, if you want just the first row, of, uh, so that's not something you would use windowing functions for, right? You could use it, you could use a, a subquery to do it, or you can use a, a Postgres extension called distinct on. Um, distinct on is, is a bit of a hack, um, and it's not, it's not standard SQL. I, I'd say I just want the first, the first two of each language ordered by price. So the price is two books of each language. Yeah, you'd have to use a subquery, right, to, subquery to pull those out. You wouldn't necessarily need to, I mean, the window, so windowing functions operate against your result set, right? They, they come later, right? If you want to do some kind of filtering where you're only selecting out like two rows or something, right? That has to be something that goes into your where clause, right? So you would need a where clause with a subquery in there to select out the IDs of the, of the two that you're looking for, right, for each language, and then you could have that. Uh, produce a result with a subquery, but you can't do that with a windowing function. And the windowing function doesn't filter anything. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, windowing functions operate against the set that's returned. Okay? Yeah. Can I leave it the, the partition? Because I, I'd like to have a running, uh, a moving average. A running average, yeah. A running average, but just, like, I don't know, like the last three results. Do I, can, can I control this, like, uh, because it just if, what would you want the results to be on the, in those columns for the other? Because if I have a time series and I wanted to have a moving average of the last three months. Okay, a moving average across the last three months, yeah. right? Well, I mean, that again, that's something where I would probably filter down to just the last three months in a where clause. No, but I mean, in, in, in time series analysis, you probably have several years of analysis and you need the moving average to... Take out the so okay, what you could do there if you had to would be to use a con, uh, use like a case statement or something, right? Because you gotta you gotta have something that gets returned, right? If that row is getting returned, you need to figure out what you want there, right? Because again, windowing functions operate against the entire result set, right? And you have to have an output for each one, but you could put a case statement in there that says 
if this row that I'm operating on currently is not within the past three months, just return null. No, no, but it's just having this moving average that gets the last three and then the last three. Even if, you, even if I have, you can, use, you can use, like use like the preceding statement. You can use like a row three preceding, so it just considers the last three rows. Ah, three, ah, okay, so I can. Yes, yes, you could, okay, yes, you could do a preceding that way, yes, yes. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't quite understand the question. Yeah, you could use rows. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Moving on. Now we're going to start talking about CTEs. So CTEs are a little bit easier to understand, in my opinion, than than subqueries, right? Or not subqueries, but uh, windowing functions. Windowing functions are pretty tricky. So uh, basically, what a CTE is allows you to define kind of a, a table, right? Um, ahead of time. And that table is specified by a with clause. So you say with, and then you specify some query, right? And then Postgres will basically run that query and return that as a table, right? That you can then reference later on in your query. Uh, the other cool thing about CTEs is that they can be recursive, right? So if you wanted to do some recursive SQL, you can have a CTE that's recursive, and I'll talk quite a bit about that in a minute. Uh, but the general idea is it's kind of like a temp table for a particular query, right? So here's what that syntax looks like, right? So you have a with clause, and then you specify whether it's recursive or not, and then you have whatever query you want. Uh, you can also specify a set of columns. If you don't, then Postgres will figure it out based on what's getting returned by that query. If you are going to use recursion, you have to specify the non-recursive term first, and then a union or a union all, and then the recursive term. We'll talk more about that in a second. So here's just a really, really simple uh, non-recursive example of, the, of how I can take a, a query that has some subselects inside of it, right, and turn that into uh, CTEs. So here, the first one is you know select and then select some text, um, and then concatenate it with a space and then select some more text, right. Down below, I actually am using multiple CTEs to build up what I'm wanting to return. So that first CTE with one is just going to be a single column, single row that it, table, right? That's what it's going to look like after that query is run, because that's what that query returns. And then with two is going to actually build on top of that. So here you can see that it's actually selecting from with one, right? And then it's concatenating some things on top of it. And then it's getting returned as with two. And here you can see I'm selecting then in the main part of my outer query, I select from that with two. Now I could actually also select from with one in the outer portion of the query. All of the tables that get defined, all the CTEs that get defined will be available to you in that bottom query, in the main part of the query when you get to it. So here's a bit more of a query that you might be thinking about because we were just talking about average price, sum price. Right, so here you can build a common table expression. You can say, okay, give me the language and the average price from the book table, right, grouped by language. So now I've got a table here that is one row for each language and the average price. And then I have some price. So I have, I'm building a, a table here that's gonna give me, for each language, the total price of all books written in that language, all right? And then down here, I can select against those, right? So here I'm going to take average is the column name that comes back from average price, and sum is the column name that comes back from sum price. And here I'm just passing those as columns into the round function. And I'm selecting from book, and I'm joining against average price, sum price, and I'm using the language column, right? So I built these two tables right, these two kind of pseudo temporary tables, and then I joined against them down in the, in the main part of the query. Again, this is more expensive. So that depends, right? So when you're, when you're running this, right, um, Postgres will optimize the CTEs independently and run them to completion, right, and then put them into a tuple store, right? 
Whether or not that's actually more performant will really depend on exactly what the query is and what the optimizer is able to do. In many cases, using CTEs does mean that the optimizer has less information, and because of that, you end up with a poorer query, right? Because these uh, top two queries will be run to completion and stored somewhere, right? They'll be put into what's called a tuple store, and then they'll be used down here. Now, if you're going to use all of those and you know all of those tuples that come back and sequentially scanning them is efficient, then it's fine, right? But I will caution you: don't use. I would not recommend using CTEs for very large data sets, right? If you have a very large data set, what you really want to, that you're going to filter down, you want to try to push all of your filtering logic up front, right? Do all the filtering in the first CTE, and that way you have a, a small subset coming back and then you can do more operations on it after that. Um, that's, that's oftentimes that just makes the whole thing really clean and nice, right? Because using CTEs looks a lot nicer visually, which is one of the reasons why people use them rather than, otherwise you end up with lots and lots of sub-selects um, and those can get pretty grotty. Was there a question? Yeah. So CTE will spill the disk if it needs to. Right, it's it's got to it's got to be able to, right? Because you could have an ar arbitrarily large result set coming back from a CTE, so it won't only go to memory. No. Yeah. So yeah, there's a big difference, right? So the the question is, is there a difference between a CTE and having a, a from clause? Right? And the big difference is that CTEs are independently optimized. Right? So we will not, so if you have like a from clause like what you're talking about, the optimizer might be able to push down conditionals into that from clause. Right? And do some kind of filtering. Right? Because it'll look at that whole thing. When you use a CTE, the optimizer only looks at the CTE by itself, optimizes that, looks at the other CTE by itself, optimizes that. Right? And then in the main part of the query, it'll It'll run, you know, it'll optimize the main part of the query by itself. Is there any reason the optimizer could have tried to uh, combine? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the short answer is it's a topic of much debate. Um, there, it's certainly technically feasible to have the optimizer optimize the whole thing, right, including all the CTEs. And there will probably be a point when Postgres does that. Uh, today it doesn't. Um, that discussion has started up yet again uh, for V12. Um, so there is there is some discussion about about having it do it. It's not like flipping a switch, right? There's some different code that has to be written to do it, right? To make sure that we don't change the semantics, right? That we don't change, because like a, a CTE with a volatile function, right, has to be run as if it's a CTE with a volatile function. Right, we can't just shove that into the main part of the query and then not run part of it, right? Things like that, because volatile functions can have side effects, right? So there's some, there would be some limits, right, to make sure that we don't change the meaning, right, when we're optimizing, because you can't do that. But um, but that's the AI, you know. But yes, there's been discussion about in cases where we are able to, right, like a case like this, we would actually be able to optimize it, right? But um, that doesn't happen today, maybe in 12. Um, I will say that a lot of people are asking for, if we do that, to have a way to say not do that. Because people have written, there's been a lot of cases where people that had written something as a subquery, right, or even with joins and whatnot, and the optimizer wasn't very smart. Maybe the statistics were bad or something, and they rewrote it using CTEs to specifically avoid the optimizer going and doing that, right? Optimizing it in a way that didn't make sense. So there's been a lot of discussion about that. Although, if you're familiar with the offset zero hack, so maybe you're not. <laughs> so if the optimizer is doing something particularly stupid when it comes to uh, pulling up a, a subquery, right, into the main part of a query and trying to optimize the whole thing, you can uh, basically create a barrier similar to what a CTE does in terms of an optimization barrier by just shoving offset zero into the subquery. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's, yeah, that's pretty, yeah, all right. Moving on. 
Sorry, it's I mean, you know, crazy Postgres hacks, right? Um, all right, so I think I went through that. So here's here's a simple recursive example, all right? So here I'm going to say, okay, values of one. That's my non-recursive term. I'm going to start there, all right? And I'm going to union that with n plus one from myself, right? So this is foo with is foo with, right? It's the CTE that we're inside of, and then I'm going to have where n is less than 100, right? And then that select star from foo with order by n is the outside part, right? Is the main part. So we have a recursive CTE here, and then the main part of the query that's just going to select the results from that recursive CTE. You have to specify the columns in that case. Or, or they, they have the optional, like foo with parentheses n. Yeah. But you, you, you have to specify the, the column names there, or is that optional? Just like oh, no, I'm pretty sure that's optional. Yeah, I just happened to put it there. I don't think there's any reason why it would be required. Is it a parameter for n plus 1? No, 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 no. That's just specifying the column name. That's just saying the, this first column that would otherwise have been like unknown column one or something like that, right? I just want to change that to be n instead. So that, that's what that n is doing up there. But it's not, it's not required. Any other questions from that? All right, so let's start talking about kind of the formal definition of, of how recursion in Postgres works with these CTEs. So we basically start out with an empty set, right? inside of our um, kind of like uh, um, iterative table, I believe is what IT is. But it's basically set with an empty set, right? And then we execute that non-recursive term, right? So we start off there, right? So now we have, for example, in my example, we have one column, one row with the value one, right? From that values one thing. So then we're gonna take the results of that and we're gonna have a results table and a working table, okay? and we're gonna assign the results to both of those. Then we're gonna execute the recursive part, okay? And what we're gonna do is anywhere we have a self-reference, right? So back here we have that self-reference, foo with, anywhere we have that table, we're gonna put into that the value from the working table, okay? And then during the execution, right, of that query, so this select n plus one from foo with where n less than 100, we're gonna assign the results during the execution to the IT table. And then we're gonna append IT and RT, okay? So we have a results table and every time we, you know, so the initial thing will have what came out of uh, that first non-recursive term and then it's gonna have um, rows added to it every time we run the recursive portion, right? After we've appended those, we're going to replace the working table with the current iteration table, and then we're going to truncate it, the iteration table. And then we're going to check the recursion, right? So what we want to look for is we're going to keep recursing until the working table is an empty set. So what that means is until that second term, that, se you know, that second half of this query, the select n plus one from foo with, where n less than 100, we're gonna keep executing until that query doesn't return any rows. All right, once it doesn't return any rows, then we're gonna return that results table. Everybody get how that, how that works? So here's kind of a, a, a more detailed review, right? So we have our non-recursive query, that's the values one, and then we have the recursive query with the references to foo with, and then they're gonna get substituted in for each iteration. And then we're just gonna keep adding into the results set for every time we run this recursive term. So I have a mention here about how this query can maybe be a little bit dangerous. And that's basically just don't forget to put in some kind of conditional that's gonna stop the recursion, right? Because if you don't have that n less than 100 there, it will just keep going forever. There's no detection or anything that we do to figure that out. However, as you see through this, right, we don't actually use recursion to implement recursion here, right? So you don't have to worry about like stack, you know, smashing the stack or anything like that, right? We actually are iterating. So here's another kind of more practical example, right? So we have a parts list, I am running 
low on time, so I'm gonna start going a little bit faster. So we have a parts list here, we have a hole, and then a part, and then a count, right? So a car has one engine, a car has four wheels, um, an engine has one cylinder head, each cylinder head has 14 screws, right? Each wheel has five screws, uh, a car has four doors, one steering wheel, and uh, each door has one window. Yay, right? Uh, the point here is that this parts list is self-referencing, right? So you have a hole and you have a part, right? And they reference each other, right? And it makes it a little bit obnoxious to try to retrieve that with regular old SQL. So instead what we have is we get, um, we use a recursive SQL. So in this case, we have a non-recursive term that is, okay, I want to see all the parts for, that make up a car, okay? And I'm gonna get the whole, the part, and the count from that parts list. And now I'm gonna union that result with this recursive term, right? And the recursive term here is basically going to take and join against list, right? List is our CTE, and join it against parts list, which is our table, where the whole is equal to the part. All right, so we're gonna step down and step down and step down, right, for each level. And as we step down, we're gonna pull out the whole of the part, and then we're gonna multiply the count times the number, right, as we go, right, because a car has, you know, four wheels, each wheel has five screws, right, five times four is 20, right, et cetera. And then we're gonna sum Right, and then, you know, so we have the recursive CTE, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a summation across that resulting, across the results from that CTE where the part is a screw, right? So what I'm doing here is I wanna know how many screws do I need to build a car, right? And then you can see here the result is 34. Does everybody kind of follow how that recursive CTE works? And that's how you can have like a tree structure inside of your table and you can walk down that tree using recursive CTEs. I think I mentioned a lot of this already. Um, so recursive queries use iteration. Uh, be aware of union versus union all, right? Union is gonna eliminate duplicates. Union all will not. Uh, you can only have one uh, self-reference, right? You can't reference the same, you can't reference your recursive table CTE more than once. Um, Primary query evaluates subqueries defined by with only once. Um, obviously, if you have a with query, right, uh, it's gonna hide any real table. So what that means is that if you actually had a table called a list, right, and you wrote this CTE, the CTE reference will come, will take priority inside of this query over some other table. Uh, you cannot have any aggregates inside of a recursive query. Right, so you can't have group by or having or order by or anything because when would it end, right? Um, and you cannot have mutually recursive uh, CTEs, right? So you might think you have like two CTEs and you want them to be mutually recursive. You can't do that. Uh, you also can't have recursive references be part of an outer join because again, when would it end, right? If it's an outer join, we're reflecting all rows. So you end up never having an ending point. Postgres also has something really cool called writable CTEs, right? So this is a case where you can basically put a delete or an insert statement inside of a CTE. So this is kind of a cute little example that I've seen people use before where you, are, you wanna archive some set of rows, so you delete them from one table and you insert them into another. Pretty straightforward. Uh, you can also have recursive writable CTEs. Um, I will point out here that the recursion portion is not a writable CTE, is not writing anything, right? That's just a regular select clause, but we're able to do an insert with the results of that into some table. Okay, I'm gonna try to go over lateral in like the five minutes I have. Um, all right, so lateral is a, is a relatively new join method, at least relatively new to Postgres. And what it basically allows you to do is you can refer to an earlier table inside of the from clauses in later parts of the query, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, one of the things that's cute is that in Postgres, 
if you are using set returning functions, we'll actually implicitly make it a lateral for you, right? Because otherwise the query won't run. So here's an example, right? So we're gonna create a table called numbers and it's just gonna have some numbers in it, right? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna select from this numbers table lateral generate series and, and the tricky bit here is that we're gonna pass into this generate series call one of the columns from the numbers table. Okay? So this generate series has max num, right? I'm creating a table that's got max num as a column and I'm gonna join from numbers against generate series and pass that in, right? And because Postgres realizes that this is a CTE, or sorry, this is a, a SRF, a set returning function, I don't actually have to specify lateral. If I don't specify lateral, Postgres will just implicitly know that it's gotta be a lateral statement and it'll run the query as a lateral. And this is what that looks like, right? So the first time through, we have one, so we, the first row in numbers is one. Generate series one to one is just a one, right? But now, the second time through, the second row from numbers is two, and we're passing generate series, we're one comma two, so we're now gonna get two rows, and then we're gonna get three rows, and so on and so forth. So here's a lateral example using subqueries, right? So if I didn't wanna have like that table that I defined, I could just use a subquery instead. So that subquery inside of that first from clause is just the same thing as what we did to generate the table to begin with. But we can use a, a subquery there instead and we can have that lateral referencing a row from that subquery. Or referencing a column from that subquery, I mean. And these two are the exact same, just one with the explicit lateral and one without. So this is just kind of simplifying it down. So if we want to, we don't actually have to do as a subquery, right? We can just down here at the bottom, you can see, you can just have an SRF, like a set returning function, generate series, and then another one after it, and we'll automatically figure out how to handle that as a lateral join. All right. Um, so I had in here that I was gonna talk a little bit of, about JSONB versus JSON. So, um, JSON is just regular text. Uh, JSONB is actually a binary data structure. Um, it takes a little bit of effort to parse the JSONB because it's gonna, we're actually gonna parse it, right? We're not just gonna store it as is. Uh, we are also gonna normalize the input when we're working with JSONB, which uh, basically means that we eliminate white space, things like that, and we don't preserve the ordering of duplicates. Um, but m any well-written application shouldn't care about these things. Um, you can only kind of really index JSON by using functional indexes, whereas with JSONB you can actually directly index it, uh, which is really handy. So you can index all the keys, or you can index all the keys and all the values inside of a JSONB. Um, and JSONB also has containment and existence operators, which are, which are very handy. Um, one other point though is that the Binary data, the way we store it in Postgres and JSONB, we use the data types that are in Postgres for that, like like a number, right? So a number inside of a JSONB gets stored as a numeric, and that means that when it gets output, it's in the output format of a numeric. So here's just an example of how uh, the difference between JSON, JSONB. This is just white space. Uh, example, so here, if it's a regular JSON, we're gonna just preserve whatever white space or, or lack of white space you had, whereas if you pass that same thing into a JSONB, we're gonna pass it back with a little bit of white space. We don't actually store that white space, it's just when we format it coming out. And here's an example of how you can get a difference between if you're storing something as JSON versus if you're storing it as JSONB, right? These are the exact same values, but the, the JSON text comes right back out as, um, as you put it in, whereas with JSONB, you're gonna get back whatever numerics output would be for that type, for that data. And then here's uh, containment and existence examples. So here with JSONB, right, you can say this has to contain that, right? 
And here you can see that ends up, it's a Boolean, so it ends up being true. And then you can do that on an individual element basis. So you can say, okay, does this JSONB contain this element? Uh, SP gist is a, it's basically, it's called space partition gist. It's a different type of gist index that allows you to, uh, it basically decomposes the space into disjoint partitions. So it can be a little bit faster than gist. So that's an example of creating a JSONB, or sorry, a gist index, spatial gist index across a point table. Uh, and that's another SP gist example that I had in here. All right, well, that's it. I mean, if you want, I can leave that up, but questions? I only have five more minutes, so <laughs> you're welcome to ask questions, but. When are your slides going to be posted? Yes. When are my slides going to be posted? Sure, sure, I'll post them somewhere. I can happily do that. That's not a problem. Yeah, I know. This was, a, this, was, this was actually an hour and a half tutorial that I've shrunk down to fit within an hour, so um, a lot of this would have had more explanation up front, but uh, I only had an hour, so. Any other cool topics that you should be aware of that I didn't put in the presentation? That's a, that's a really interesting question. I don't, I don't have anything off the top of my head. I don't know. Do you have a you got an idea? Uh, a, a cool thing that I learned, I learned recently is the filter clause in uh, aggregate functions. Oh yeah, filter clause in aggregate function. Sure. Yeah, that's cute. Yeah, like cube, and roll -up. cube and roll up would be another one. Yeah. Which one? Cube and roll up grouping sets. Okay, group, yeah, grouping sets is something that, that could possibly be added into a tutorial like this. Um, those are pretty cool. Yeah? Using the explain calls to, to, to tune down performance to see if a CTE performs better or worse than the super query. Oh, adding in explain analyze and performance stuff yeah, for this? How, how <sighs> would I approach that? Like, <laughs> before the with, inside the no, no, yeah, you just, oh, if you want to just run explain, you just do explain analyze right before the with clause. And it'll, yeah, but yeah. Can down to parts of the query? Well, yeah, you can just pull out sections of the query, but they have to be self-consistent, right? If you do an explain analyze when you have CTEs involved, it will actually, it'll show you the plan for each CTE, right, it'll, in the explain analyze output. So you'll, you'll actually see what all the plans are for all of them and the main query as well. Any other questions? <laughs> okay. Because it was like uh, I couldn't find out the functions like to, to do uh, within and, and things like that. I don't know. It seems to me probably I'm wrong, of course, but it seems to me that it was very limited. Uh, SPGIS was very limited. I think what you're saying is that you found the point and the data types inside of Postgres to be limited, which is very much the case. Yeah, so, so I mean, SPGIS is just a, wait, were you, you were going to post GIS or you're doing the GIST? My idea was just selecting points inside the area. Yeah, okay. It's very, very limited. Sure, okay. But I couldn't implement with SPGIS. I had to, to use. Okay, but was that a SPGIS or was that something with GIST and SPGIST? Because, okay, so we've actually been improving the point data type in Postgres because it didn't have a lot of the functions that you would want, right, the capabilities, and part of that is because nobody cared because post -gis. <laughs> right? At the end of the day, unless it's a very limited use case, I wouldn't use um, the point data type in Postgres itself. You know, I, I mean, if you're fine using just a very very simple two-dimensional space or whatever, then fine. Um, but if you're doing anything that's actually geospatial, use post -gis. Like, yeah, that's, that's the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I saw many people using JSON with IDs, uh, but without any kind of constraint, like for a piece. And it's like a... a uh, it's insane. Exceeding. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. And yeah. A application developers. Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I don't have I don't have a great answer to that one. I mean, for my two cents, I think JSON B is is really nice when you have um, 
a very, very large potential set, right? You have, you have thousands of potential keys, right? And you don't want to have to have thousands of columns. Fine, right? Any place where you actually have some structure and you know you want to have these sets of columns, make them columns, right? Just, just make them columns. And then, you know, maybe somewhere you have a null in there or whatever, if, you, if that's acceptable in your data design, fine. Um, but that's, that would be where I would use JSONB. Um, and what I really like about Postgres is the fact that you can combine those two, right? You can have a set of columns, right? They're going to exist everywhere. And then inside of your JSONB, have just the special stuff, right? What people don't realize is that the JSONB structure, uh, we have to repeat the key name for every row, right? So JSONB is still very, very inefficient overall compared to JSON. Is there another question really quick? Yeah. yeah. You said that distinct is a kind of tag. Yeah, it's a, it's a Postgres non-SQL standard feature, yeah. So you use a function instead? Uh, you can't use, no, 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 because remember, distinct on is something that allows you to reduce the set of rows that are coming back. Windowing functions don't do that. Okay, windowing functions operate on the rows that are coming back. All right, I think that's, I think that's it. I'm out of time, sorry. Thank you, everyone.